This is a paper on strength and mortality by Ruiz et al. There are a couple of things that I need to talk about with you guys before we get done, and I did get behind. I told Campitelli I needed more time, and the son of <laughs> 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 uh, <clears throat> So we're not gonna go through this in a whole lot of detail because I have something I really need to talk to you guys about at the end here. Strength after knee replacement, this one I do want to talk about a little bit. Will, uh, or John Patrizzo, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, was the uh, primary on this one. This is a Danish paper that looked at progressive strength training commenced immediately after fast track total knee arthroplasty. Is it feasible? What's the short answer? Yes. yes. It's feasible. So here's the deal. <clears throat> it's a very limited paper on a very important topic. This is what we're talking about. Knee arthroplasty, basically a total knee replacement, right? Here's the before. Yeah, this person needed a knee replacement. They got bone on bone in the medial compartment of the knee here. You can see that clearly, right? Now, much better. Here's the problem. Rehab after knee replacement has traditionally been delayed until up to two weeks after surgery. Why? Because they want the edema to go down. They want the swelling to go down, right? And there are concerns about pain during rehab, right? So, and there are also some concerns about, about the prosthesis itself. So the concerns have been traditionally, we want the swelling to go down, we're worried that it'll be too painful for people to rehab, too soon after the operation, and we have to be concerned about the prosthesis. Concerns about the prosthesis are not as pressing. Now, these prostheses are pretty robust. What did they do? They did an observational cohort study. So it was not a controlled study, right? They didn't break this group of people down into a control group and a training group. They just did the same thing to everybody and saw what happened. 16 subjects who had just undergone a total knee arthroplasty underwent progressive resistance training with knee extensions and bands and leg presses very soon after surgery. The training load was progressively increased during the study interval. Pain was assessed by visual analog scale, which is the standard. I've always thought it was a little silly, but that is the standard measurement for pain in the biomedical literature. They measured range of motion with a goniometer. They measured knee effusion with a tape measure. They measured max walking speed, right, during the study. And what they found was is that all of those metrics improved during the course of the study, right? Pain tended to be increased actually during the exercise sessions, but it tended to be improved afterwards. And after the third session, knee effusion, knee swelling went down dramatically. Nobody died. Nobody's leg fell off. Nobody's prosthesis failed. Right? They didn't hurt anybody by doing it, and they improved their, their leg strength significantly. So you don't let, have to like, replace somebody's knee and let the atrophy continue after the surgery, according to this small study. You can actually implement progressive strength training of the knee very soon after knee arthroplasty, according to this study. This, this work needs to be validated in a prospective, randomized, controlled trial, but I think we all kind of anticipated that this would be the case. And it is kind of interesting that more and more of the orthopods are starting to think along these same lines. So I have a client who just got a hemiarthroplasty, half the knee joint replaced, fast track, and told his orthopod on his follow-up visit, you know, I know what you're gonna say, but I would really like to get back to my deadlifts and my squats and my presses. And the orthopod said, go for it, it's the best thing you can do. So we are making some progress out there. What's that? What was the age range they all tended to be older. I want to say 50 to 80. If somebody has the paper, they can pull it out and tell you. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, a little bit of time on this one. Interset rest, Henselman et al. This is the one that I mentioned earlier that is not only interesting from a program perspective, 
but it also suggests possibilities that I would like your minds to encompass today. Uh, this is an implicit literature review, not a systematic review, not a meta-analysis published in Sports Medicine in 2014. The primary reviewer was Christian Ward, the boatman, categories programming. You know Christian, right? He's the Marine Corps colonel who almost killed our beloved Rip. Hi, Christian. Conventional wisdom is that hypertrophy work requires short work between sets. You all know this, right? So if somebody says, well, okay, I'm an intermediate now, I want to do some hypertrophy work, I want to get huge, I want to get swole, I want to feel good about myself, I want to feel tight, right? So what are you going to prescribe? You're going to prescribe sets of 8 to 12 to failure with short interset reps because that's what you do when you want to get somebody huge. If you want somebody to have big guns, you're going to have them do bicep curls, 8 to 12 with short rest between, about five sets. Anybody, would anybody do it differently? No, because that's what you do. That is the prevailing conventional wisdom in the strength and conditioning community. And this, this is not unimportant to us, right? I mean, you get some people, especially some older people or some very sarcopenic people, people who are skinny, and you get them through the novice progression and they say, well, I want to be a bodybuilder. Or, no, I don't want to be a bodybuilder, but I would like to beef up a little bit. I would like to do some hypertrophy work, right? Or you have somebody, you know, a, a little old lady who says, I, I'd like my butt to be a little bit bigger, right? Stuff like that. I mean, that's, it, it is important to people. You do need to know how to prescribe hypertrophy training as a strength and conditioning coach. You do need to be able to do that. So this is a review by Henselman and uh, Schoenfeld. And all they did was they pulled all the available literature that they could find on this topic and reviewed it. And what did they find? The rationale for short interset rest in hypertrophy work includes that it promotes a favorable endocrine response. No. The authors conclude, based on their reading of the literature, that the data for that is at best mixed, and in fact, it may be counterproductive by increasing the cortisol-testosterone ratio. It may, in fact, improve the secretion of human growth hormone, but as the authors point out, who cares? Human growth hormone is so, you know, 2000s. And the whole systemic trophic model of hypertrophy, of muscle hypertrophy, is now under attack um, because of the work of West and other people who are saying, yeah, you know, muscles spill all these trophic factors in the circulation, but the effect of those trophic factors on actual muscle hypertrophy seems to be limited and unclear at best. Now, those tro trophic factors in the circulation are doing something, but what they don't appear to be doing is getting you huge. Now. There may be some paracrine and autocrine signaling going on at the level of the muscle tissue, the muscle signaling itself, that is important for the development of hypertrophy of big guns and stuff like that. But those factors actually being spilled into the bloodstream, making you huge, it doesn't seem to be the case. It also rests on the rationale that you're creating metabolic stress and swelling and the elaboration of more reaction products which stimulate in increased muscle growth and hypertrophy. The authors say the literature on that is actually unclear at best. And finally, one of the rationale is, is that it promotes muscle damage, eccentric damage. You're doing that uh, like that, and you're tearing up your sarcomeres, and you're going to promote more muscle growth. The authors point out that the data on this is of poor quality and decidedly mixed at best. Finally, there's the rationale that it just works. It's what everybody does and it works. This is what guys who get huge do, right? But actually, if you look at the science, it may be that most guys who get huge do this, but a cause and effect relationship between short interset rest and the development of muscle hypertrophy has never been definitively established. The data totally sucks. At best, it suggests that rest interval has a mild effect on a hypertrophy, and the authors point out that actually the total work volume seems to have a more important impact on a hypertrophy, but work volume is limited by short interset rest. So you may be screwing yourself here. Finally, they bring up safety considerations. 
there's going to be considerable form breakdown with more fatigued athletes and short, short interset rest. And that's an important consideration, especially when you're working with a population like mine. Now, that's what the paper says. Here's what I would say to you. I want you to really think about this. That paper is in the peer-reviewed literature. It is an implicit literature review. Jordan, where are you? Jordan? All right. All these guys did to publish this paper was they went out and they used Google Scholar and PubMed and they did a bunch of searches and they pulled every paper they could find on a particular question. And then they wrote it up. And then they sent it in and then they got it published. These bastards basically wrote a term paper and put it in the literature. That's all they did. I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm saying that as a suggestion, as an invitation for you to think about one possible way you might make a contribution as a starting strength coach to the canonical literature. They didn't even do a meta-analysis. They didn't do a systematic review. All they did, all they did was they went out, they pulled everything they could find on a particular focus topic, on a particular focus question, and they became the experts on that particular topic. Nobody in the world knows more about this particular topic than these two guys right now, because they just wrote the paper on it. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? There's an opportunity for people who are a little bit nerdy and a little bit academic and a little bit interested as starting strength coaches to make contributions to the literature. Is everybody hearing that? I'm just going to leave that there. That's what I think is the real importance of this paper. So those of you who are hearing what I'm saying, take a look at this paper, look at it closely, read it closely, see how it's done. Look at how it gets done. And think about a question that you might look into, a topic that you might become the expert on. Something to think about. A and in before anybody asks, yes, I will help you. Uh, relative uh, safety of weightlifting and weight training. This is an important paper for you to have in your files. I'm not going to go into it in any detail. Same, uh, I have to talk just a little bit about the study on belts by Miyamoto. Steve Hill was the primary on this. Um, what were their objectives here? They wanted, to, this is one of the first papers to look at the biomechanics of lifting belts. They wanted to look at the effect of lifting belts on performance, muscle activation, intra-abdominal pressure, and intramuscular pressure of the erector spiny muscles. It's a Japanese study. They took seven very compliant bros with some time to kill. They took data from them uh, during Valsalva and various isometric exercises. They're pictured in the article where they basically went up to this thing. I can't remember exactly what it's called. And they, they do this or they, they do this, right? They looked really cool doing it too, right? With and without wearing a belt such as that worn by weightlifters, right? <clears throat> and cinched as tightly as possible, <clears throat> right? They took EMG readings of the erector spiny, the rectus abdominis, and the external obliques with all the caveats about the, the limitations of EMG. Intramuscular pressure was measured directly by an invasive transducer or catheter. Basically, they poked a catheter into the muscle so they could measure the pressure inside the muscle and intra-abdominal pressure was measured. Now, how do you suppose they did that? Anybody? Huh? Uh, that's right. <laughs> 
for science. <laughs> what did they find? The intra-abdominal pressure did not differ significantly between the belt and no belt during Valsalva only, but it did change. The intra-abdominal pressure did not vary during isometric lifts between belt and no belt conditions. But here's what's interesting, right? In the Valsalva only, they found pressures of 72 to 80 millimeters of mercury. But while they were lifting, they said it didn't change between belt and no belt conditions. So this is the belt condition, 80.2 millimeters of mercury. But when they were actually not lifting, but doing their isometric contractions, they say it didn't change. But it was only in the 40s and 50s. So can somebody explain to me why when they just did the Valsalva with and without the belt, these were their intra-abdominal pressures, but when they were actually working, the intra-abdominal pressures were only in the 40s and 50s. I don't get that. So right away, I'm thinking, this data doesn't line up. The lifters were not instructed to hold their breath during the exercises, which kind of blows the whole thing out of the water. But here's what's interesting. The authors claim they did anyway. That may be the most valuable thing to take away from this paper because we see over and over again in the literature where the authors say, we told them not to Valsalva, but the little fuckers did anyway, <laughs> right? You see that over and over and over again in the literature, right? Even if you tell people not to Valsalva, they Valsalva. Why? Because that's what Mother Nature has programmed you to do when you lift heavy shit. That may be the most important part of the paper. Their conclusions were that wearing abdominal belts raises the intramuscular pressure, which they found, of the erector spiny muscle and appears to stiffen the trunk. Wearing abdominal belts may contribute to the stabilization during lifting exertions. It's a Japanese paper, there's a little bit of English going on here. Um, so, you know, smoke them if you got them, kind of thing. Nice belt, bro. Um, and, Here's our critical review, small study, seven bros, isometric exercises, come on. How does that help us? Who wears a belt during isometric exercise? The in intra-abdominal pressure didn't vary during the isometric lifts between the belt and no belt condition, but the lifters weren't instructed to hold their breath anyway, so we don't know what to make about all that. Why not tell the lifters to Valsalva while lifting? And if in fact they did do it anyway, why are the abdominal pressure values so much lower than in the Valsalva only condition? It doesn't make sense to me. The theoretical model that they propose in figure six, I think this one is one of our freely available papers, you can look at it, makes Isaac Newton cry. It certainly made Steve Hill cry. He couldn't shut up about it. And the Valsalva and rectal pressure. So let's talk about that. I'm going to suggest two different conditions. One, where your rectum feels empty, and one, where your rectum feels full. In which condition will you Valsalva the hardest <laughs> while on the platform? There's a time and a place for everything, people. Uh, anaerobic masters, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Anything that I'm going to tell you is already in the abstract. Please take a look at it. In the meantime, Rip, can I have just five more minutes? Well, that's not going to fucking happen. Because I'm almost... Okay, fine. My choice. It's a nice paper uh, by Rayburn et al., published in the European Review of Aging Physiology. I was the primary on this one. And we like this paper not only because it looks at issues that are specific to master's athletes, but because in the process it covers a lot of great exercise physiology. So you don't even really have to be that interested in master's to want to read it. All you have to do is have an interest in exercise physiology. It covers a lot of ground. Um, and it's a really good read and really accessible. So, 
It's a comprehensive literature review, an implicit literature review. So once again, it's basically a high school term paper, just a really, really elaborate, well-written, well-researched high school term paper. That's all it is. Just putting that out there again. Looking at the anaerobic master, masters who participate in anaerobic activities, either professionally or in their sports. They define anaerobic performance as the work capacity for maximal performance events, right, maximal effort events lasting from, you know, a f they say 10 seconds? How about like one second? How long does a snatch take? How long does a snatch take? One and a half seconds at most, the whole thing? Right. So they say from, from 10 seconds to about 100 seconds, okay. These activities are dominated by, as you know, the immediate phosphagen system, right? The ATP that's already present in the muscle and creatine phosphate through the enzymes creatine phosphokinase and adenylate cyclase in addition to the, my, the specific myosin kinase forms that are involved in those kinds of very rapid explosive movements and flat, fast glycolysis, you're not supposed to call it anaerobic glycolysis anymore, you call it fast glycolysis now, which is dominated by hexokinase and phosphofructokinase and lactate dehydrogenase and all that stuff that you had to learn in college and then forgot, okay? Distinct from the aerobic pathways, which are measured more by VO2 max and citrate synthase and succinate dehydrogenase and happens in the mitochondria instead of the cytosol. Masters experience a multifactorial decline. I'm really sick of like masters and decline going together, right? It's very depressing. Masters experience a multifactorial decline in anaerobic performance. You see a linear decline from about the middle of the fourth decade through the eighth decade, and then the decline becomes quadratic. Right? It becomes nonlinear. It accelerates. So. It sucks to be all of you in a few decades, right? It's just what, what's going to happen. The uh, acceleration in the decline seems to be more pronounced in women. So what are all these different factors that are involved in the decline in anaerobic performance in masters? Gender, again, women decline faster than men and the acceleration in their decline after the sixth, seventh, eighth decade appears to be more pronounced. So that sucks. Muscle mass. Masters tend to have less muscle mass because they tend to lose muscle mass as they get older. And that's going to contribute to a loss of anaerobic performance as they get older. Muscle fiber type. We've talked before about the change in the distribution of muscle fiber types in aging muscle. Aging. As, as muscle ages, the atrophy of the muscle is dominated by atrophy of type 2 fibers, the high-powered, high-strength, big-ass, juicy fibers, right, that are exactly the muscle fibers that you don't want to lose, but are the most expensive ones for the body to maintain, so they go first. Muscle architecture and strength, so as muscle mass declines, you see a change in the angle, the pination angle and the angle of attack of the muscle on the bone, right? We all know that as your quads get bigger and tighter and everything, you improve the attack angle of the muscle on the bone and becomes closer to 90 degrees. That all changes as you get older. As muscles get older and thinner and more frail, pination angle and angle of attack tend to diminish and decrease efficiency. Substrate avail availability, your ability to generate, deliver, and restore substrate, by substrate I mean fuel, in the muscle declines as you get older, right? So you have to rest a little longer between sets. Anybody notice that yet, right? I have to rest longer between my sets than most of you do, bastards. Because it takes me a little bit longer to restore substrate in my muscle than it does you. Metabolic efficiency, again, this has to do not only with the anaerobic system, but also with the aerobic system, right? The efficiency of the aerobic system, the ability of the aerobic system to restore the anaerobic system. 
So increasingly, what I think about is this. I think about two batteries. You got two batteries. One of them is a high power, low capacity battery. And one of them is a high capacity, low power battery. Right? One of them is your so-called anaerobic system, which is high powered, but low capacity. It'll go Right? And the other one is your aerobic, aerobic battery, your high capacity, low power system. It'll go all afternoon. It'll just drone on. The low power, high capacity battery can be used to recharge the high power, low capacity battery, but not the other way around. Make sense? So you go, and then you plug it into the charger, which is your mitochondria. You plug it into your mitochondrial charger, and you let your aerobic system recharge that high power, low capacity battery. Your ability to do that efficiently changes with age, just like it does with your laptop, <laughs> right? It's just like, you know, eventually you, you reach a point where you plug your laptop into the wall and it won't charge, right? That's you as you get older. Okay? Accumulation of reaction products. What are they talking about here? They're talking about lactate, they're talking about proton, they're talking about ammonia, all these waste products. Lactate's not really a waste product, we know that, but all these reaction products, free radicals and things that you make when you work out in the anaerobic range, right? Your ability to eliminate and metabolize and use those reaction products diminishes, and the efficiency with which you use them diminishes as you get older. Aerobic contributions we just sort of talked about, and heredity, right? You're either genetically gifted or you're not, <laughs> right? So all of these things contribute to a multifactorial decline in anaerobic performance in people as they get older but they also contribute to anaerobic performance in anybody. You take any athlete and these factors play a role in their anaerobic performance. Not just an older person, it's just that these are the factors that decline as people get older. Now what do you notice about most of these variables? Anybody notice anything about most of these variables? Most of them are trainable. That's the good news. Most of them are trainable. <laughs> You're laughing at gender, right? I'm not suggesting that anybody cut off or sew on anything, right? Gender is obviously a genetic determinant, but the authors point out that gender also has a sociological dimension particularly in older populations, that is subject to alteration, right? So there's a psychological component and a sociological and cultural component to gender that may be amenable to intervention. No, you can't, you know, you can't make Caitlyn Jenner into a, you know, female athlete. She's not a female athlete, right? But you can take a little old lady and change the way she thinks about exercise and life. Right? You can break her out of a stereotype that she's lived with all her life and show her that she can get strong and that she can perform in the anaerobic range. Does that make sense? That's why the question mark next to gender. I wasn't trying to be funny. All these other components are subject, more or less, to training intervention. Heredity, not so much. You're stuck with your genes, for now. For now. It's a nice paper. I really like it. I hope you'll take a look at it. And once again, it is just a term paper. It's a significant contribution, but it's just a term paper. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>